sounds are good. Yeah. It's 1159 at Radio Free America. And this is Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans. Another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. <laughs> And welcome, everybody, to our Daily Gun Show. Come to you live each weeknight at midnight Eastern, and we talk about guns. And uh, we're joined tonight by a couple of Nevadians. Nevadians. Got uh, Theodore jumping in from northern Nevada. Thanks for joining us tonight. Glad to be here. And we got a dog jumping in from southern Nevada. So we got everybody covered. Thanks for having me, G. But, and there is no middle Nevada, right? It's like all government land and basically yeah, it's, it's all blm between north and south desert plus there's I means there's nothing to do there it's just flat desert desert right you uh, area desert. So it's all it's all mountain yeah, it's all it's all mountains between that separate the north and south oh okay right. the impression it was just big wasteland so that's just an uh, area up there by salt lake city where the salt flats are yeah yeah uh where i'm at uh, <clears throat> on the Humboldt River up here, we have a silt that's sort of like a powder that is uh, on the ground. Four feet down, it goes to a hard pack, which is like a solid iron plate underneath. Okay, but you can grow almost anything. There's lots of plants and and trees and everything growing on the land. Oh, okay. And, but it's uh, mountainous, though. Right. Yeah, I'm at 5,000 feet. Elevation. Oh, and Vegas is what about two thousand? Yep, we're about two thousand feet elevation, and we're more uh, closely similar to Arizona in that big, wide, vast space of you know nothing between the mountains. Yeah. Well, we don't have that. That's the thing, Arizona. We've got a lot of like green. Like everybody thinks we're desert because I guess we technically are, but. We do get a lot of rain, so we get a lot of green. That's how our cactus get to be so big. They get a lot of rain. Well, see, that little problem is we, we'd be more green, but we have these dumb, uh, oh, what are they called? Hickory tree, not hickory. We have these trees, mesquite trees that grow out here that kill everything. <laughs> yeah, we got mesquite. Yeah. It's an interesting one, though. Yeah, that's how they keep the bugs away. They basically put out. Ship. Anyhow, so we're talking about guns, and today we have a couple of subjects. The uh, gun magnets, uh, we can talk about a couple of different things there, and then gun coatings. I sent a link out to Gun Snob, but uh, you might have already, you might have stuff to do in the morning or something. Uh, there are some links out there, and if you're interested in joining the conversation, let me know over on the gun channel side. Gun Channels is a community we built five years ago now, and uh, we have a way to communicate over there live during the show. That's what it's all about. We're by no means trying to uh, make this a one-way uh, stream, so uh, utilize the ch chat over there and jump in be part of the show. So gun magnets, anybody use them? I don't know what they are, so go ahead. And maybe I do and maybe I don't. Well, so, Doug, what do you think of when we're thinking of the gun magnets? So I'll be honest with you, the only gun magnet I've ever done was when I was living in a non-free state, and I used one to modify my gun so that I could dis uh, disassemble my magazine. Otherwise, I have not experienced with gun magnets. Oh, I don't know what that is. Is that some way to like put a thing in your mags that limits it or something? It was a it was a way to bypass the bullet button when California had that. Oh, okay. A way to comply with the uh... Yeah. It was a way you could comply but you had this little magnet that you'd throw on the bullet button gotcha. that would allow it to work like it should. Because basically their infringement was something to the effect of it can't just come out like you have some kind of tool so by putting a magnet there that's the tool and then that locked something into place and allowed it to drop out yep 
Okay, so yeah, what I'm thinking of uh, the magnets at least, and that's the thing, there's all different ways that magnets are used with guns, really. Um, there's, uh, what I'm thinking of though is these uh, just neodymium magnets, I guess, just big ones that can hold like 35 pounds or something. And uh, they wrap them in either Kydex or plastic or I've seen it in suede or some sort of synthetic suede probably. Um, and then with a couple of grommets, and then that way you would, you would you know, attach that magnet to, I don't know, underneath the table or sometimes in those those pieces of furniture that look like a mirror or a table or a shelf or bed stand or something. And uh, that way the gun you know, is kept there, but you know, with enough force, you just yank it off the magnet. So, it's oh, so like, you mean like a, it, okay? Uh, I get what you're saying. You mean like a holstering kind of mechanism, like yeah. we use like with yeah, kitchen which, knives, kind of exactly like with oh, kitchen. Yeah. That's the best way to say it. I should have said it that way. Um, you have a neo uh, magnet. You have to slide it to uh, pull it off, so it's on the countertop because you can slide it out, slide your firearm out. It's kind of depends on the guns and stuff. Like if you've got a shotgun with just one magnet two hands you're just taking it off of there but you're right if it's like a pistol and it's in a weird position then yeah it's it's a tough magnet so you are going to end up kind of sliding it off of there some of them are designed to do that even and that's one of my concerns is some of them are designed where like like you can kind of draw from it by just pulling it along the magnet Yeah, see, I, I've lived in places where earthquakes were common, so I'm curious, like, how strong are these magnets? Oh, you know? They're really strong. And they're at the same strong. time, if, it, if it's strong enough to hold up, say, my shotgun during an earthquake, yeah. is it really going to be something that my wife's able to easily grab off the wall? You know? No, it's, it takes a little technique, because you're right. It is so strong that sometimes with, like, a shotgun, you might actually pull it off so that in such a way that it, becomes like the hinge of the fulcrum or whatever it would be and you would kind of pry it from the magnet with the barrel you know like you'd let the barrel hit the wall behind it pull away at like uh you know like using the leverage yeah. of a shotgun with a re with a pistol or with a revolver or you know, the knife uh with other things that i've seen people put onto those magnets they are so strong that unless you're in the right angle where you can just pull it off like if you're at the right angle you're a human you can pull it off there but uh some of them when it's not at, if it's at any sort of disadvantage to your muscles then all you're doing is you're pulling it across the magnet until it doesn't have any other metal to hold on to and eventually it gives up to you but yeah they're strong magnets you can probably get them in different degrees of like how much magnet they put into the little unit uh, depending on what type of gun and what kind of application, but for something like a vehicle where you'd want it to be, you know, basically as secure as possible, uh, that's probably the big ones, and those are like 35 pounds. I think that I would be inclined for something like this for like a behind the the cabinet kind of gun, something like hidden behind a bookshelf or something. But I don't know if I would want that on any of my like absolute ready to go kind of guns. Well, I don't if you take a holster, if you're talking about a rifle or a shotgun, and you have sort of a long holster for it, and it's uh, behind the holster, it's going to hold it really tight for you in the event of uh, some sort of a earthquake or anything like that. At the same time, you'll be able to slide it out for self-defense or be able to shoot from it really easily. Well, yeah, I, I, under a table. Under a table. I, I could, I could see that. I, like, if it was like, if the magnets are holding up a holster that's holding the gun, I could get behind that. I just don't know if I'd necessarily, like I said, the, the idea of, you know, having <laughs> where I might have my, where my my gun might be sliding, I have to slide it across the wall to get my gun off. I don't know if I necessarily like that. I, I think he was thinking about. I don't know what he was thinking, but I'm saying I'm, I'm thinking of like under a table, under a coffee, coffee table. You could right. slide out instantly and have it available or and present it, you know, say uh, in your living room facing your front door. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a rig like similar to that on one of the desks in my house. It just, it's 
in a holster instead of in a magnet. But yeah, I agree. I think it has a place. So that makes a good point. And that's exactly what I was talking about. A lot of times they're marketed for like under a desk or under a, well, usually under a desk, like you know, near the drawer or whatever, you'd put this magnet and then that way your gun is, I guess, underneath your desk, just like in a movie sometimes. Um, on the gun channel side, BTP is saying, uh, I don't use gun magnets, but I do use a tool magnet bar for handgun magazine storage. So that's another thing I should have said. You can get them at the hardware store, Harbor Freight or whatever. Uh, basically a bar magnet that you put in your shop or whatever. And then that way you can just like hold screwdrivers and wrenches and stuff uh, on that magnet. And you've seen how they are to come off. You Usually you got the leverage on a tool. Like you can kind of pry it off of there using the wall behind it or whatever. Yeah. But uh, with a gun, most of the time, I guess that's where I'm doing a bad example of trying to explain it. But if that little magnet there uh, is attached to that gun at 35 pounds of pressure, you're not just pulling it off. And if you do, you're pulling it off and you got such a reaction that it's going to slam into your leg or into the floor or whatever it is because you're going to have to really pull on it. So usually people pull the gun towards themselves, which kind of just drags it along the magnet. Eventually the magnet has to let go because it's attached to the cabinet or whatever. But uh, with a holster, that would easier what about in a gun safe to keep it like for earthquake you were talking about earthquake that's keeping all of your firearms in california because i would have never even thought about an earthquake i've never I've only ever experienced one when i was a kid traveling in california but uh no they definitely do something not the kind of magnets we're talking about or at least i'm thinking of because those are made for like one gun to like hold it in place and potentially even in like a vehicle or like you know something like that so they're super strong, but I have seen in safes and things uh, like display racks where they'll put those neodymium magnets wherever the gun touches. You know, it's like basically on the rack. Um, and I could see somebody in California doing that, I suppose. But I think well, I wouldn't do it. And I'm about to talk about my issue with them that they magnetize your gun. Like guns, half the time are made out of metal, steel, metal, right? So yeah. every time swipe a magnet across there, you're magnetizing it. If you ever bought one of those little dealies to magnetize your screwdrivers, it only takes like five swipes and you got a pretty magnetized screwdriver. You do that over and over and over and you're creating a more powerful magnet every time you do that. And pretty soon your gun is collecting every staple and little grit. And I live in, you know, I live in metal filings and grit and staples and tacks and stuff. So know parts of staples and the old zip ties and shit so i don't want my gun collecting all that kind of crap even my knives i got sick of putting my knives on magnets because you know, every time i put a knife down i get a bunch of metal grit and shavings on it no that i think that's completely a well thought out reason to not do it right there you know, i mean i think the only reason i might I could possibly see wanting to mount guns with magnets as if you were doing some kind of display and they weren't guns that were ever going to be set up for like ready use. Maybe because then you have, a, you could like do a display wall without any hooks or anything obstructing the view, but I've never found the hooks on my display walls to be that offensive. So, so, not so you can do like wire, you can do little straps of leather and sometimes it looks classy, you know, having something Know, applicable to the type of gun, yeah, of wood or something. And that's what I was going to say in the safe. If you're worried about um, some kind of earthquake, instead of the magnets, I think I would go with uh, just a strap. I mean, something to step up from zip ties, put some eyelets on there, and then run some shock cord through it. I mean, you're not like you're grabbing every gun out of there every day, make it a little difficult to grab your guns out, but it would. Really from falling over ever. Well, I like the uh, the foam uh, extendable bars they make for safes nowadays. Where it has like the it has the cutlets in it for for barrels, and you just kind oh, of extend talking, it to put it in. You're talking about a giant uh, chamber flag almost, except it goes up to the top of your sa underneath your shelf, and then Velcro's on. Well, they have the ones that look wrong, but I've seen these other ones they have, and they come in all kinds of sizes. 
where they extend from the middle. So you can put it on the other side of the gut to keep, if you're worried about them like falling over and stuff. So. I think we're talking about two different things. I'm thinking of a thing where it comes out of the barrel of the gun and goes up to the shelf above it and it's like a carbine. And it's oh, no, no, no. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about it looks, this is something that looks, you know, like they have those foam things that Velcro along the walls of the safe that but you put in there. Corrugated metal or look like a wave. Yeah, they make those that only instead of having to mount them to the wall, it has a little extender in the middle so that when you put your rifles into the safe, you can then put this one in on the other side of those to make sure they don't fall forward. Oh, okay. And it just kind of hugs them. So it literally makes it so that they can't fall around. Or if you've got yeah. like a gun that wants to keep falling out of the safe because of the way it's... Holds it in there. Yeah, maybe maybe you have a Steven shotgun that because of the way it's shaped, it always wants to fall towards the safe door. <laughs> yeah, I've had a few like that. And when you put optics on them and stuff, it starts screwing with them. Yeah. Potatoes so, has a link. He's typing out in the text like if he doesn't have a link, and he's saying. For display purposes, he likes using a wooden dowels with a brass case glued to it and whatever caliber the gun is in. So then that way, uh, I guess that oh, that's, a good idea. Uh, that's the kind of idea my wife would like. She would think that's real cute, matching the bullet casings to the caliber. That would look good. So general consensus, magnet's not a horrible idea, but not for us. Yeah, I think he had a very valid point about it collecting uh, dust and uh, uh, you know metal shavings and you name it. You don't want that being collected or magnetizing your firearm. I mean, back east I could see it, but out here, chances are you drop something in it, like a giant magnet in the dirt, and it's coming up with filings and stuff in it. Either there's going to be a magnetic dirt or some kind of I mean shavings or rust or something but it ain't coming I have up a, one of those metal cabinets that I keep like tools and stuff and on the outside of it I have one of the, the big meal uh, magnets on the outside of the uh, thing is what magnetizes the whole side of the uh, of the uh, cabinet and then I just stick things against the side of the cabinet you know, things that I'm working on. Yeah. It's strong enough? Oh, yeah. The metal magnetizing is real good on one of those metal uh, filing. Um, they're not filing cabinets. They're metal. Uh, they're like little two-door opening metal cabinets that you. Sure. I got done by those things at auction all the time. So they're like five, ten bucks at the most. So uh, I really like them for like putting ammunition in or stuff. So uh, what I do is I buy those. I was really into when I had desk jobs before. I was really into little puzzles and knickknack shit to keep you busy. And uh, buy these little magnets that are like BBs basically. Uh, they're actually a lot like BBs, except instead of being a bunch of BBs, they're a bunch of magnets. So when you start putting them together they turn into shapes and stuff so it's sort of like a puzzle or a desk oh, oh yeah I know those. yeah they used to come with those magnetic platforms that you could build stuff on you didn't even need a platform but i don't know maybe they did but okay. anyway on a couple of these sets they were let's say they were 30 bucks if you went to like the mall and bought one they'd be like ten dollars if you went to ebay or amazon or something so i bought a couple of sets off of amazon and then they're just extreme time wasters. Like if you start playing with them, they're they're just amazing. So I got I got sick of playing with them. They were wasting my time. So I ended up just sticking them to my metal cabinet like that. And that's what I'm getting to. Um, they become perfect like thumbtacks for a metal cabinet or server cabinet or gun safe. So if you got places with metal, get yourself a set of those little balls. Try not to play with them too much, and then use them like little thumbtacks. They're, they're tiny, they disappear, and you can hold up posters or, I don't know, anything. They're really handy. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty cool idea because I, I hate putting tape on stuff. So that would be a, an awesome alternative. And if you don't want, like, let's say you got like bumper stickers, right? And you don't have like big sheets of refrigerator magnet. Like if you got a small bumper sticker just to get to a refrigerator magnet. So anytime you see like a, I don't know, like my uh, real estate people, you know, they bought this house like a billion years ago, still send me like a calendar every year. I don't even complain now because it's a giant piece of refrigerator magnet. So I can take a bumper sticker, not a bumper sticker, but like, you know, some logo sticker and stick it on there and trim the rest off. And then I've got a magnet instead of a sticker. But uh, if you've got stickers that are too big for that, then you just use those little magnets. And it's, you know, you can stick a sticker onto a safe or something, but not really waste a sticker sticking it on your safe. Sometimes you. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. Because then if you upgrade your safe or whatever, you can just peel it all off and put it on the new one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then somebody I've seen, you take a hot glue gun or whatever, and you jam uh, little 22s or some other calibers on there, and then it takes it to the next level up if you're using them like on a refrigerator, like thumbtacks. The bigger, easier to hold on to when they have like cartridge or something on them. There you go. Uh, we, we should we should we should be streaming this part of the uh, conversation on Pinterest. <laughs> yeah, the, the Pinterest craft section, DIY. We need a, like a little piano and an accordion riff for when we go to our DIY section here. There you go. All right, so that's your chat from Nevada about magnets. So now we'll go into gun coatings. So again, I guess uh, one of the actual painters, I'm assuming you guys don't paint. I guess I'm assuming you guys paint. Nope. Uh, I hate painting. Okay, so we don't have any Dura coders here tonight, but uh, what are your feelings on gun coatings? Well, as somebody who's colorblind, so I can't really see what colors people pick for all their coatings and stuff anyway, I am I want any coating that's going to keep my gun from rusting. And the more durable, the better. That's my general philosophy on coatings regardless of every all the other aesthetic side. How about you, Theodore? Well, um, you know, besides keeping it from rusting, but aesthetics has a lot to do with it too for me, and that is you know that uh, in Nevada, where we are, <clears throat> we're in a really, really low humidity state. Uh, yep. So up here, I mean, getting to 7% humidity is a huge humidity, you know? Um, so that type of thing, then, but there's other things that attack uh, firearms, um, mold type things and stuff like that. And the ability to have a really clean, nice surface to be able to clean your firearm and to see that you've gotten everything, yet nothing seeping into the steel or anything like that, I think is a, to me, is the greatest benefit. You might call that aesthetics, but it's, to me, it's uh, what makes the nicest part of having a coating on a firearm. I grew up when there was bluing and there was parkerization, I guess. And I can remember a couple of articles about Teflon coating or something. And I mean, I guess you'd see a, a chrome plated gun occasionally or something like a parade or a ceremony or a commemorative thing. And then uh, I guess paint, but not really paint ever. So that's been a new thing and i don't know about the the thick stuff i've seen working through shops and stuff i've just seen too much i don't know if it's even poorly applied i think if you put enough on there to be useful it's going to add thickness right it's going to add some kind of layer and that's what it's for and if you if it's Sorry, thin enough, well if it's thin enough to not uh be an issue with tolerance then it's barely there 
and how long is it going to last? So obviously it's all an application thing. You put a lot on there, it's going to last forever and it seems like it lasts forever. And if you barely put any on there, that's going to wear away quicker or show signs of wear. So anyway, I just, I, I, I'm down with paint. I don't have a problem with paint, but I don't know if I'm down with the, uh, the finishes, the fancy things that can be baked or about the Cerakote the and the Dura coats and the different coats. Yeah, like I said, I mean, I've seen lots of rattle canned guns over the years. You can normally tell when you touch one that it's been rattle canned. But if it's protecting the gun and the person's happy with it, then I don't see a functional reason why it would be bad. Uh, but it seems like people, every time someone tells me they have a gun Cerakoted, it seems like that gun has to be Cerakoted again and again and again, or at least that's the experience of people I've met. So I don't really know how I'd feel if I had to keep getting my gun recoded. I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on what they're doing. Um, you know, if you're doing something where the gun gets, I don't know, it's out in the sand or something a lot of sandstorms or something so it's literally getting sandblasted or if it's in the sun all the time or if it's in the cold all the time or if it's wet all the time you know everything i guess is going to be different but uh again if they're designed to if you're applying them because they're protecting it and then they need to be reapplied uh i don't know if that's necessarily isn't that part of what they're there for aren't they perishable at that point because then that way what they're doing is saving your metal your metal is still well, I guess what I'm saying is that I, depending on where I was living and my application at the time, I would pick whatever coating was the most durable for my environment. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, I hear you. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were still talking. No, go ahead. I was just about to start something, so. Oh, Okay, I was just going to say a little different point of view, okay, and this might be a little bit of an unpopular point of view. Uh, you know, when they first came out with ARs, I thought ARs were the ugliest damn firearm on existence, and that is because I mostly collect older firearms, okay? And when I was in the military way back when, we had the M16 and whatnot, so the AR was not a big, you know, to me it was still Mattel toys which made the original M16 when I was in the military. Then someone pointed out that if you love your firearm and it is what you enjoy, then you're going to go to the range more often and you're going to shoot that and you're going to be more proficient at that firearm. And so that's a good reason to have any kind of firearm that you love. And so if you coat your firearm and you do things to make it so that you enjoy your firearm more and you get to go to the range more because you love how wonderful your firearm is. I think that's a positive thing. Yeah, that's a real pretty good way of looking at it. Well, yeah, I'm not going to argue with that at all. I mean, anything to get people to actually go out and practice. Right. But if you think you got the best firearm in the world and it's really cool looking and you want to go to the range and shoot it and show up and you want to go there, you know, every week and fire it because it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And I think that's a great thing. Definitely. Now, as far as the coatings, I was going to throw in there was that uh, some people put them on there to change the look. And I don't like having a black gun when I live in tan and, you know, green. They were giving me it's black at night all the time, sure, but uh, daytime it's a lot of tans out here, a lot of sand colors. So um, black kind of stands out. So um, we always just put spray paint on there, and comes to think of it is just like a, a color thing, and not trying to protect the gun or do anything more than change color of it. Um, I like this; it does wear off relatively quickly gives you a chance to not have a consistent color you know it adds to the to the concept to keep the thing broken up so the letter would have little lines on it so uh you just touch that stuff up once more yeah makes sense 
wasn't it Yankee who uh, did his handgun? He did a white or something. He had a handgun that he had all redone and everything about two years ago. He's had several. He had, uh, he had one that he like Cerakoted. It was like all white. He had got new handles for it and the whole bit. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it white or green. Definitely not a black gun, though. All right, well, I guess if we get into painting, that's a whole nother one. This was supposed to be gun coatings. Now, I don't think what else there is, but for the most part, I guess we're talking about the sprayed on applications. Now, if you paint, what kind of paint would you use? A high temperature paint? Yeah, a lot of people use the high temp Duracoat stuff. Hey, potatoes. Yeah, I just actually used the Duracoat that was made to be flat in like desert colors, like, you know, basically the camouflage series or whatever. And they make them in different browns and greens. And so I just use that. How much of your firearm do you have to take apart in order to spray paint it? I know people that'll just assemble it and then spray paint it. You know, if they're not trying to go for some kind of two-tone look where they want their barrel to be separate from their handguards or something, if they're literally just trying to make it not black anymore, they'll just assemble it, mask off the optics or close the lens covers, and then uh, basically just go at it or maybe use, like, a, I don't know, some sort of a thing with, like, a netting or a laundry bag or one of those techniques with some leaves or something to give the... You know, a little rudimentary shape or texture, break it all up some more. But anyway, usually they'll just set up the gun first, and then I don't know. I guess I do know people who will paint and own it, so then it just you know becomes like more of a quilt of colors. You know, the handguard's this color, the vert grip is that color, the barrel's that color, the stock is some other color. Then I know people okay. that just buy parts that don't even pay attention to what it ends up looking like. You know, it looks like Frankenstein they are oblivious. They're just looking for the operation on it. I'm guilty of that sometimes. Like, oh, you're using a weird color green with like color pale green that they only made for like a week that nobody liked. Well, that yeah, was I mean, on the shelf or that was in the five dollar bin. Pretty much. I mean, I like I said, I in my particular situation, I can't tell the difference a lot of times anyway. So I'm much more concerned about the functionality than the look. He's buying all those pink and purple parts that they make. <laughs> That's why I'm terrified every day when my wife comes home with a new shirt she wants me to wear. <laughs> Do whatever makes you happy. That's what I say. Where do you fall on coatings? Um, I'm all right with it. I... I don't really coat my stuff. I don't I haven't done. I mean, I've done Duracoat on a few things, but not. I don't really care. I think the uh, for like a hunting rifle, if you're gonna make it camo to match the environment around you or whatever, then yeah, that's that's good function. But I could take it or leave it. If you're doing it just to make it look cool, that's cool too. You know, whatever, literally whatever makes you happy. I, I, I don't really care one way or the other. But we have young you uh, can kind of insight. I only care <laughs> as a general real relativity put out there. I agree with him. I only really care about what other people do to their guns. If they're going to take it out hunting with us and they put all this time into their finish and they get upset when it gets scratched, that'll annoy me. Yeah, yeah, that, that bugs me. Um, any gun that I really care about, if, if if I like, I care about it being pretty, I'll try to find it in stainless because you can polish it out. Any weapon, gun, knife, whatever that I will buy because I like the like. It's just because of the aesthetics. You know, like certain 1911s I've owned that I've gotten in stainless. Those are just weapons that never saw the, that they never went into the field. I never I had to give them the opportunity to get messed up. Uh, yeah, I'm okay with that too. That's fine. 
<laughs> you know, I, there's a couple guns that I own that I don't really fucking take out and shoot. I just bought them because I like them and they're pretty and I'll display them. Yep. I haven't ran off half our audience with your controversial opinions on stuff. What do you think about magnets? Uh, that's a bad idea. So you're anti-magnets. I am very anti-magnets. I work in a steel plant and I get steel like particulate like coating my face and my glasses and stuff. I can't imagine all the stuff that gets brought home and eventually ends up like in my carpet or something. Uh, magnetizing my gun would just be a bad idea. And then, yeah, it just drops on your carpet and then comes up with, you know, just a little bit. What does it take to screw with something in there? Mess with a spring or cause excessive wear on something over time? Yeah. And then what if a firing pin gets magnetized? Yeah, I thought I was thinking about that too. It gets like hung up in the whatever, whatever it would be, and sliding through or whatever the slide itself, I guess. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about the firing pin. That's a really good point. Even if the pin isn't, if the slide starts getting magnetized and it just gives it enough to do a light strike yeah there's there is nothing worse than a needing to fire your gun and hearing that click with no bag all right well one of the reasons we do the show on a reg on a daily basis is to feature some stuff we're going to talk about a gun shop and today it's a shooting range but we also like to feature a gun channels member so uh, since tater shut up late the uh, Gun Channels member, but uh, we're going to talk about a shooting range today, the Clark County shooting range, so probably appropriate that we have a couple of Nevadans in here. So Clark County shooting range, we talked about it the other day actually, I think, too. Um, it's uh, just about half an hour from the Strip. Uh, it's in the, whatever you want to call it, the Las Vegas Basin or Valley, and it's cool because it's up in the foothills of Vegas, so it's kind of north and west i guess and northeast uh, yeah on northwest so as you come up from vegas and go to the ranger first thing you're going to hit is like the campgrounds i think and then you hit the uh the probably trap and skeet no shoot up into the mountain so that's got to be pretty neat but then you get to the boarding clays and those shoot back towards the so you're basically shooting back over into Vegas. It's got to be a cool experience, especially shooting at like dusk or something. Um, they have like little golf carts, so it looks like you get a golf cart and you go do the sporting clays like on your own pace. That seems really cool. I we need to try that sometime. Uh, anyway, then you keep driving up the foothills and you get to the rifle and shotgun, well, the rifle and pistol ranges. And then they have like a big classroom or something up there. And then uh, the ranges that I'm guessing are for the uh, classrooms when they have some sort of training going on. So a really elaborate facility. Have you guys been to it? I have been up there uh, once since I moved out here, and I have not been back simply because it's too far from where I live for me to be bothered with. But it is a very nice facility. And it's all brand new and stuff. I remember going out there a long time ago, and it was sort of just a county range, and yeah, it's super nice now. Teddy, any chance you've been down there? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm mostly a northern Nevada person, not a southern Nevada person. And then, like I said, the dad, we're talking about uh, the weather and whatnot, the heat down in Vegas to me is impressive. Yeah, I hear that, and it's got to be. One of those things that's seasonal because it does get hot in vegas but it's worth uh knowing that it's there there's a bunch of rental uh, machine gun places in vegas and at least a couple of those are regular ranges so you could just bring your guns and shoot at them and rent some machine guns and shoot your regular guns at the same time uh, yeah. but the clark county range is definitely bring your own guns and you know it's just like going to any county range i think it's like seven dollars for the day or something so uh, yeah really inexpensive and then uh so it's definitely an excuse if you're ever going to vegas uh the airport there is 
completely familiar going in and out with firearms. So I don't know. I've never heard of any weirdness or anything. Uh, I know that when I was leaving Vegas, or no, that wasn't Vegas. So anyway, there, there. I've never heard any horror stories about traveling with guns in Vegas, though. And uh, again, they're really familiar with it. So if you were to uh, travel there, go on vacation or whatever, and you're looking for things that do that aren't going to cost you that much money. Um, get to hang out at a cool range and hang out with a bunch of people from Nevada that shoot. Uh, uh, yeah, for, I mean, you, you touched on the traveling thing. For anybody who's, you know, worried about traveling in the Vegas area, the, the Vegas area is incredibly nice and about guns and knives and all that kind of stuff. You, you know, you'd get more funny looks for not having than you would for having. And there's a lot of misconceptions about, you know, people thinking that you can't carry in parts of Vegas. Uh, you can carry just about anywhere as long as if someone asks you to leave that you do. Well, it's North Las Vegas that you can't carry, but otherwise Vegas. You can. And you can carry in the casinos and you can drink in Vegas when you're trying, when you're carrying. Pretty neat. That's right. You just cannot be drunk. Yep. And like you say, that you just want to, yep. actually it's Boulder City too. So don't go to Boulder City. Yeah, Nevada is an open carry state. Yep. So hopefully that gave uh, Taters enough time. Is our member of the day? Nate twenty ninety nine. He's a newer Gun Channels member. Been around probably about as long as I have. Uh, he's, he's always tagging me and stuff on Instagram bagging a lot of other people on and stuff on Instagram that they might be interested in. It's so, uh, definitely pro 2A. He's a newer gun owner, only about the past couple of years, but uh, he's really, really uh, taken to it. Pretty knowledgeable, especially for someone who's only been into it for a little while. He just posted some stuff on the main page today. Did he? I didn't even notice. Yeah, he posted me with some robot thing, and then he had posted something about what kind of conspiracy thing. Oh, yeah, it was something about how uh, these memes are pissing off people and why it pisses them off. The NPC memes. I've actually, I'm not a big Twitter person, so I don't completely understand what's going on with that. I don't think it's Twitter. I think it's like Reddit or 4chan, one of those groups where all the kids get together and are sarcastic to each other. Uh, yeah, the only Reddit I do is I'm in the dog world, so I don't get involved in any of that other nonsense. But I think it's just they're, you know, aware of what pokes them well. I mean, memes are definitely useful means of getting information across, and they you know, seem to spend a lot of effort, time to figure out which ones are the most effective and which ones. Well, I don't know. Like, you know, not just annoy them, but also hopefully make them think. At least it's, I would like to think that's what part of the concept is. I'm watching that video for me makes me think that's what. There's a little bit of a uh, bigger picture to it. You know, they're trying to get these people to realize that they're shouting about, uh, let's say, uh, Trump being not uh, Hitler when they're really the ones doing it in the very fascist, most fascist. Yeah, way. it's that whole thing about, like, only the government should have guns, but Trump's the government and Trump is Hitler, so therefore only Hitler should have guns. Yeah, like, yeah. They're, they're not just, like, funny or whatever, but they're hopefully like mirrors, you know, they make these people realize what they're saying. Anyway, that was kind of interesting to, and I don't know what this one, this recent one is just, I guess, to make them, well, basically they talk about it in that video, that the, the NPC non-player character, right, from a video game, it's just the, you know, the little computer-generated bots that walk around to, you know, either confuse or to create you know, extra stuff happening in the game, but they don't, they don't make a count to anything. There's no consequence to them. And yeah. the concept that if by calling them that, it, it annoys them extra because they're told you're the one who's going to, you're so special. Everything you say is important and 
you know, you're the main character here. So it bugs them to be told them to be told they're just a, you know, not important character. And I guess using the games is the way that they understand it or something gets through to them quicker. So that's from my take. That's what the thing's all about right now. That's good to know. I heard about the NPC. I just didn't understand why it was such a bad deal. Oh, you say you have way to poke them, you know, way to make them realize that they're screaming about stuff that they're being told to scream about. Yeah, makes sense. It point, made a point, and I don't really follow these things, so it's interesting to see. And that's one of the things I'm glad you brought up, Nate, because that gave us a chance to bring this thing up. One of the neat things about gun channels is, you know, it's a community. It's not, I don't know, some kind of a medium to sell you, you know, gun accessories or to uh, keep people buying a subscription to something or, you know, there's no incentive other than hanging out, chatting about guns and stuff. But obviously everybody's got their own interests and their own, you know, skill sets and their own life experience and whatever. So uh, it's neat to see stuff like that because between him and a couple of the other guys um, we don't have to go seek that stuff out necessarily when it's well I mean uh, since you brought it up I'll, I'll kind of add to what you're saying uh, I've belonged to a lot of communities online since I like la over the last couple of years that I've been learning how to use computers and stuff and gun channels is one of the few that's actually kept me involved because it's not an echo chamber I mean we have arguments on gun channels but, you know, we're not arguments, but I should say disagreements, you know, we, we, but we have the foundation that we all agree that we're pro 2A and we're for that aspect. But we, you know, there's no mandate that everybody has to agree on things. It's one of the reasons I think I've stuck around as long as I have is because of that openness that you find here and that you do have all these people with different backgrounds. I mean, even me and G have had some arguments before <laughs> on late night chats, but, you know, that that's just accepted here. That's one of the things I like about it. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's also like we don't always have to disagree either. It's not like you just come here to fight it out about you know, devil's advocate or just to have a cash out discussion. You know. Yeah, no, it's, it's you're just you're free to be you here, and that's what I like about it. And that's on gunchannels.com, a community that we built five years ago, and that's one of the reasons we built it, so people like Nate can come around and do his thing and be part of the conversations he wants to be part of and contribute in ways that he felt like contributing so that we could take pieces of it and talk about it on our shows and other people can talk about it on their shows. And together we create a place that you know keeps Second Amendment stuff, conversation going, and we know that there's going to be a time when we're going to need the, the channels to resist some kind of new tyranny. But you know, we're, some of us are efforting constantly to uh, get to a point where we use this forum, this, this uh, you know, version of people getting together and chatting to start efforting and pushing some shit down so that we can get the NFA removed. Uh, get rid of 4473s completely, get in some sort of coordination with uh, people that create content or that are consider themselves influencers or that have audiences from however uh, ways and on a, whatever different kind of platforms. So that by working with it, some kind of consistent message perhaps or with a consistent set of agendas, we can uh, affect some social change. We've got lots and lots of audiences if we all work together. So. One of the goals of gun channels and we'll continue to uh effort towards that and all the people that are participating are going to be part of that so thanks to the people especially that watch these shows over on the gun channel side might not be perfect but it is gun channels it isn't a place that hates you and hates everything that we do and our lifestyles and our interests and our property probably our morals since you mentioned it uh, do you think he'll ever really be able to get rid of NFA or get rid of 4473s? Yes. We live in the United States of America. We got rid of slavery. We got rid of women's like second-class citizenship. You can easily get rid of fear of your neighbors. That's easy. 
we live in a place where every, there's so many guns. There's guns to there's more guns than people, and we live in that same place where really one of the safest places to live. So I think that's once we start figuring out a way to explain that to everybody so that they can actually see that they've been around guns this whole time. Heck yeah, and full auto. There's nothing about full auto that should scare anybody. If anything, it's just a way to stir the economy a bit. And once you remove barriers to uh, innovation and, and uh, adaptation and stuff, we'll get some kind of cool plastic bullets or some sort of cool reclaimable you know, bullet that you can reshape or something uh, so that we come up with all kinds of fun ways to use full auto recreationally. Yeah. I mean, we we do live in the only we live in the country with the perfect setup for our laws to evolve, more so than any other country. Oh, for sure. I was hearing about these plastic bullets or something. Are they real? You mean the uh, polymer compressed ones? Yeah. They are real, and they make awesome cheap plinking ammo. So it's just some kind of hard 3D printed thing, or some sort of no? Uh, what they do is it's compressed powder. They like compress the uh, polymer powder together, and so like when you shoot, they designed it for shooting steel. So that way, when you're shooting steel targets, there's no chance of a ricochet. It vaporizes upon hitting the target. I just yeah. heard a lot of people talking about it around here, and I didn't know. Well, they got it was a really hot topic in California when California started set threatening to ban lead. So that's sort of a replacement for the steel bullets. Are the uh, the, the the compressed ones? Are they better? Um, I guess the steel ones had problems in damaging the firearm, and they had problems with uh, long distance. Well, also, uh, some a lot of states won't let you shoot a steel core bullet. Right. So, yeah. You know, I first heard about the polymer bullets. Uh, matter of fact, the only commercial ones I've ever seen were the Ruger, I think they were called Ruger RX, that were uh, polymer tipped. I've seen polymer tipped before for like lever guns and stuff, but not actual projectiles that were 100% polymer. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, let me look it up real quick. But yeah, I think once we get to a place where, I think there's a couple of different ways to get to know NFA, and we should do that as a topic sometime. Um, uh, but if you were to get a third party like libertarians in there, and then you started getting some nuance and some you know, non less polarization with uh, various um, visit, you know, political issues or whatever, then. Uh, I think there would be some position there to see um, all kinds of things, but uh, removal of laws, because that's really what we're talking about, is just removing law. So uh, I think that's one way to do it, but I think once you get to, like we've already had, uh, we have CCW in every state, and as that um, reciprocity and things change and we get more states with constitutional carry, that's going to change to where you know there's going to be different perception of carry and uh, the suppressors and hunting, the suppressors and just uh, shooting sports and uh, putting suppressors on shotguns at the there are various uh, trap and ski clubs that are out there and you know quieting them up uh, for all those reasons I think you could see eating away at the NFA um, from the, the suppressor side, uh, from the short rifle side and the short shotgun side, we've already got so much precedent with these firearms that are out there now, the little guns that aren't anything right now, the firearms, 
That's... The shockwave and the TAC-14. And... Yeah, and the, the mare's legs. Yeah. Those cover action pistols and stuff. So all of that, the existence of all of those and the length of any criminal at anything is uh, creating precedent for that. So now you get to full auto and then all it would take is an effort to show how easy it is to make anything full auto or bump fire. I mean, bump fire is itself, which is using that as an aim. Well, oh, bump fire is so bad that, that all semi-auto should be bad because you can bump fire any semi-auto. You don't need that stock. That stock just facilitates it a little bit. But it's actually easier for me to just bump fire any semi-auto by just bump firing it. I don't need that stupid stock. It gets in my way. So you should, you know, with that logic, they should have to remove all semi-auto. Since that's not going to happen, we should be able to push the other way and say then if you're suggesting that all semi-autos which can be bump fired are fine, then just let us have full auto. Because there's no difference and criminals don't use full auto. There's no reason to keep it banned. And... Uh, I don't know what else there is. Grenades and stuff. There's, I guess, some demand for that stuff, but big bore, that's no big deal. Who cares if bigger bores? No, there's no danger by having shotguns get bigger or rifles get bigger. So destructive devices would be easy to... So, I mean, maybe grenades would be the tough one. But everything maybe. else, hey, we could attack. And the 4473, I think we should have been attacking that a long time ago. There's no need for it. It makes a bunch of privacy issue for no reason. The bunch of like medical and what's that called? Doctor private, right? Doctor patient privilege. Doctor patient. Oh uh, yeah. It's infringing on that unnecessarily, and there's no consequence. So if, I, I, there's no result. I think they should be justifying. They, the anti-gunners, should be justifying or required to justify why the 4473 should even exist. That should be a thing on every single ballot, every single state, every single election to be removed the 4473. It's not necessary. Once we're consistently pushing against the 4473, the antis can't ever suggest that they need more background checks. All they have to they, they constantly be trying to justify why we need any background check. And we live in then once we successfully defend us from the background checks, then 68 falls apart. Then you say, what, what's the difference? If we don't need a background check, why do you need to go to an FFL? So FFLs all fall apart, and then there's no need for the definitions if there's no laws. Because the 68 is all the laws, or it's really definitions at this point. Can you see my screen, G? Yeah. All right, so this is the ammo that uh, I was talking about. Uh, Ruger, yeah, Ruger's the one who brought it out. It was uh, they when they brought it out, they were marketing it as both a self defense, and they also made a version without the little grooves in it for yeah for plinking. But I mean, this is what it was. It kind of it hit the market real hard, and then dis like disappeared almost as fast as it came up. I bought a box of the nine millimeter stuff when it was on sale, and I mean, it handles just like any other ammunition, but. Yeah, so yeah, they, they do make these polymer compress bullets. And those are like oh. metal with polymer holding it together, right? Uh, so the self-defense ones had a little bit of metal mixed into the polymer when they were molded, but the plinking ones were 100% polymer. Hmm. I do have a question, Alex. Or beanbags. I understand that only police can use beanbags or something out of shotguns. Depends on the state. There's no, why would you use a beanbag though? Like, I don't know if there's, there's not going to be a law against it, but it would be like, try to explain that in court. Well, I decided to shoot a beanbag at this guy. Yeah, any, they're, prosec they're... any prosecutor is going to say, if you felt the need, if you didn't feel that that person needed to die, you should not have had a need to pull a firearm on them, basically. Pretty much. If you so pull a gun, it's, it needs to be because somebody needs to die. Yeah, and if you kill, because you can still kill somebody from a rubber round or a beanbag round, and the premise of, well, I shot them because they were, you know, you, you're going to have a hard time making that case that you killed somebody in self defense because you were in fear for your life if you accidentally kill them with a less than lethal round. 
Oh, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but what if you're, you are, uh, your stance is that you use the beanbag because you're morally against killing people. <laughs> you just want to stop. Then you shouldn't have had a gun. Stop a but you're supposed to stop a threat. You're just being you're in fear for your life. You want to stop the threat. I could. I without deadly intention. Yeah, I could. I'll put it this way. There have been people who have bought into the whole rock salt myth because of like the movie Kill Bill and stuff. And don't get me wrong. If you like want to use rock salt to scare off coyotes and stuff off your property, very effective, cheap to reload. But there are people who've used rock salt to shoot home invaders who have ended up paying the medical bills for their home invaders. So I don't necessarily want to even think about how you what kind of prosecutor is going to twist you around for using less than lethal rounds. That's what I wanted to know. And you gave me a fantastic answer. Yeah. There, there's no real reason to have them other than they're super cool. Like some of the stuff that less than lethal little koosh balls and little rockets and stuff. Really neat. Oh, novelty fact. There's all kinds of fun stuff. I think that kind of stuff would be cool to collect. Rubber bullets, beanbag rounds, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So outside with my you know, story. So one day I went to this. I haven't told this one in a while. Uh, Strat show, maybe six. That couldn't have been seven. So it might have been eight, but I don't think it could have been eight. But I don't know. I think it was more like Strat show two thousand six. Uh, it's at the same range that it's always at in Vegas, Boulder County range, but it was a lot smaller back then. And it was a lot different back then. There was like this big inflatable house, like a log cabin that would be made out of air, <clears throat> like a bounce house, but it wasn't. It was just like a giant log cabin made out of a bounce house. And you'd walk in there and get your badges and stuff from, I think it was like Bass Pro or whoever it was that was like just uh paying the bill for SHOT Show Media Day every year that for a while there. And we figured out after a while that the system was, you have to go through that stupid tent and wait forever. But nobody cared. We, like, you didn't need to go through that tent. So we just did go through the tent. And we were kind of first to some of the lanes. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that was out there was this less than lethal stuff. And they had, I don't know, the equivalent of, some kind of dummy, maybe like a, a martial arts dummy or something out there. And you're not really supposed to shoot not, uh, less lethal stuff at the bad guy. You're supposed to shoot at the ground and bounce it up into the bad guy. So that's what they were doing. They were shooting it in the ground and up into the bad guy. And I was like, hey, do you care if I go down range with a camera and you shoot me with that stuff? And they're like, no, go ahead. So uh, I went down range and they kept missing me. Or I think Joe was trying to shoot me. So whoever kept missing me. So they were trying to bounce it, and then they shot maybe three times. And uh, anyway, we almost got kicked out of there. They uh, came running over and got all mad that we went down range and were shooting at each other. But uh, that was our experience with the uh, less lethal stuff. I forget the name of that company, Lightfield or somebody. But uh, that's what happens when you get there first, I guess. You can do stuff and before they get a chance to... Great signs that they don't do stuff like that. Anyway, I did get hit a couple of times, and it kind of hurts, but it's not that much. So uh, I imagine it'd be better if it was coming out of like a blunderbuss or something much larger than a shotgun. It kind of stung, but paintballs actually hurt more. Or like a 10 gauge? I don't even think a shotgun can just get enough stuff for the. Basically, they were shooting me with little. Um, Goose balls, little like rubber things that had, uh, what do you call those things? Like tentacles that are like little octopuses. And I think it was supposed to slow it down so it, would, it couldn't get fast enough to hurt anybody. But it was also not, I mean, I think it was more for like a crowd maybe where you they're seeing a shotgun get shot at them. So they're going to react to oh. that. Yeah, crowd control rounds. Yeah, because they weren't even like being back. Bean bags you might shoot at somebody. These were more like rubber, solid little solid rubber things. Then they had one. Well, it's, 
a little rocket look like a little missile. Well, it sounds safer than the old chalk rounds they used to use. Or sometimes the chalk wouldn't break up. That was those were dangerous. And they just shoot them at people then probably. Yeah, the idea was that you'd fire at the crowd to disperse it and the chalk would just make a big, you know, cloud. But sometimes those chalk pieces wouldn't break up. That was yeah. I just noticed that Pink joined us. How are we doing, Mr. Pink? Yeah, not bad. I don't have internet, so I'm on my phone. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. Yeah, Bob was uh, able to shoot the, uh, I'm thinking it was the APX. They were APX-like rounds uh, two years ago at SHOT Show. But, uh, yeah, they were pretty neat. Um, the one guy that was running the, bo uh, the booth there, he uh, showed us a video where guys were actually running up on the uh, steel targets like a foot away and was still shooting them and the rounds were just disintegrating turning into dust whenever they hit the uh, steel target that's pretty neat yeah like i said i the box that i bought i thought was very nice plinking ammo i just don't know how i'd feel about carrying it for defense purposes ET just posted a picture of a bear getting whaled on by uh, Caliber, is it? Oh, 458. But uh, with one of them twisty bullets, looks like a screwdriver. And it looks like it uh, took out that bear print. Yeah, sure. If that's a polymer bullet, I like it. Snap apparently fits in 458. It's it'll do the job. So I'm sitting there. I forgot what I was doing. I was looking at something online, and then Paul Harrow video came up, and uh, I watched one of his videos about um, the Miami shootout. Anybody seen his videos? What do you think about? Them? I know the Miami shootout. I haven't seen his video. But have you seen his videos before? Oh, yeah, I've seen some of his videos, yes. Anybody else watch this guy's videos? I've heard what the name, the name again? in a video. Paul Harrell? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Paul Harrell? Yeah, I've seen his videos. Yeah, I think he's got like 200,000 subs or something. Yeah. <clears throat> he always goes through you know, the ballistics and the everything of what is, what type of firearm he's using, what type of ammo he's using, trying different types of ammo. And I think my favorite is his meat target. Yeah, so he was doing the Miami shootout and lots of different things there, right? So the calibers, the using a revolver or not, uh, reloading and all different kinds of stuff. So, uh, and then not having machine guns, that that was interesting. Um, but uh, whenever he gets to the part where he's talking about the efficient effectiveness, I guess, of the calibers, uh, he did that meat target you're talking about where he dresses up uh, um, various materials so that it emulates a body, I guess, a bunch of times. Yeah, he uses That's not uh, it's a lot of money and time to prepare and set up and do that you know that off air part would be a lot for that yeah i think you know i agree with you those the amount of money and time he has to put into those videos is way outside my range but he does he does good work i like to think of him like nothing fancy minus the douche <laughs> that was insensitive. I shouldn't have laughed at that. But uh, yeah, no, I, I mean the Miami shootout. Now, was he using ammo comparable to the ammo they had available? Mm, I don't know if he was doing anything. Well, yeah, I imagine as far as using it in the targets, you mean? 
Yeah, if he was like replicating the Miami shootout, because I mean, like nine millimeter back then was weak by comparison to today's standard. Oh, I just don't get the impression that that guy would half-ass it. So I'm assuming I don't, I don't pay fucking attention to that kind of shit. Um, he was also talking about the more the the whole shootout than any specific thing. So he was also showing like he would kind of narrate it, and then he would cut away to some time on the range, and then he would uh, maybe simulate the one guy where his hand was shot and he was using a shotgun from behind the vehicle, you know, so he would shoot a couple of rounds, uh, I guess, demonstrate, you know, the difficulty of that and the effectiveness of it. And then, uh, I remember I must have watched a couple of videos trying to mix them up, but you know, his meat target thing was just for like a portion of it to talk about the nine versus 40, I guess. Maybe I'm mixing it up with the 940 video, but to show like the, um, whatever the cops, I guess. Shot. Yeah, the cops. The cops were armed with 38s and nine millimeter. And how that nine hit the guy, but it got almost to the heart, but stopped short of actually stopping the guy. So it eventually would have killed him, but it didn't stop him. You know, and then that's why they went with 40 because they. Whatever you know, said, or he would have done the same thing except gone that extra four inches or whatever, and just put the guy down. Yeah, that's what. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. The, the Miami incident is what led to them wanting to switch to ten, and then ten, the marksmanship all went to hell. So they created the forty. Yeah. Anyway, I've been, I've heard the guy, but I never watched a video, so. Is interesting. He definitely puts a lot of time and effort to him. I got the impression from people's description that it was just going to be like, you know, boom, 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 here's some video. But he's putting all kinds of time and effort in it. Didn't Dirty Harry use a 357? Uh, I think he used a 44, right? Dirty Harry's a 44. It was supposed to be a 44, but um, for a lot of the scenes in Dirty Harry, they ended up in the in the film, he had actually a 41 Magnum because they were having trouble getting uh, getting the 44 mag. The gun? The gun. Huh. A yeah. lot of the filming was done with a 41 mag. Yeah, I mean, those movies were 30 years ago, so... All right. Well, with that, I think we're probably over the hour a little bit. Just put uh, all the video, all the shows up onto iTunes and all the different hosting platforms that are out there for podcasts. So everything's up to date and did uh, renumbering at the same time. So we know we're on actually number 673, like taking into account all the shows we missed on the road and stuff. So uh, we're on episode 673, and uh, stay tuned for more coming up. And uh, has anybody got anything before we head out to plug? I just wanted to say thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, thanks for I saw you were on there, and you were green, and I know you like to jump into stuff, so there you like. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah, it was a very enjoyable conversation, and I learned new things, so that's always a good day. And I got you got some fan stuff over on the lesser side the youtube side uh woods is saying teddy is awesome and, and i think he means that in like a very gay way but jesus <laughs> god okay that's why i say that here's why i say that he didn't say not being nice okay he didn't say not gay so how am i supposed to take oh, okay. that okay Okay. <laughs> he also says the same same thing about that Paul Howe, so we don't know what's going on in the Pacific Northwest. And he didn't jump in here, so he would be able to, to comment on that if he was in here. All right. Anyhow, All right. so uh, uh, Dog, you got the book? Is it selling good? Uh, yeah, yeah we're, we're, slowly, uh, we're slowly making sales. I'm going to kind of plug everybody real quick. That's all right with you, G. Um, if, 
you're interested in dog stuff, you want to talk about uh, dog questions, buy dog merchandise, or even enter our contest to enter for free dog merchandise, go over to musledogmafia.com. And if you would like to help with, you know, getting us away from our YouTube overlords, please check out GunTube. Dot org, which is Night Strike's pet project for uh, Night Strike. You might know him from Hit or Miss, Tuesdays at 9 o'clock. And if you want to join the number one pro two-way firearm social why don't you all head on over to gunchannels.com and become a member because it's free and it's awesome. Right on. Thanks. I need to start recording stuff like that so that I can like I hit a button and have it play. That'd be professional and it'd be cool. Uh, Pink, anything coming up? Going on? Not at the moment. I'm just working, so. I hear that. And Taters, you doing a show after this? I got a show going on. Uh, yeah, I can. So uh, that's one of the links somewhere. Yeah. Um, we'll do uh. All kinds of neat stuff over there, including live conversations. So uh, I've seen that uh, Gary just got uh, some patches. So uh, he's getting his panel filled up there. Pretty cool. And I guess that's it. So uh, thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. And we'll be back tomorrow.